Hello, welcome to lecture 64 on additional information on radioactive and radiometric dating. I'm going to get started with a question. Why is there so much radioactivity uh, on our planet Earth? I mean, it's, it's actually dangerous to live on this Earth from a radioactive perspective. Why? Why would it be there? Is it so that we would have some clocks so that we can tell how old everything is to heat the planet? Radiation maybe kills bacteria and keep them, keeps them in check. Uh, you can see some other things, maybe, maybe just like radioactive bananas, or maybe just, it's just, just, just happened that way, or God made it that way. Pick your favorite answer. I would suggest that out of all of these, there was purpose and design, and maybe G is, uh, is one way to express it, but we can be a little bit more intentional about actually seeing what the purpose is. Heat the planet. In fact, I would call it a long-term heating solution. So if its primary purpose is for heating, then we have to be careful about using radioactivity for other purposes. Doesn't mean we can't, we just have to be careful about that. All right, there's some interesting things about radioactivity that we wanna to learn today. And one of them is about this amazing little bacteria who can do some crazy things. So I'm gonna play a little sound file and uh, you get to look at my pretty face here while you listen to this. Maybe it should be coming up. Here we go. The toughest bug on earth. Next on today's Creation Moments. And now here's our Creation Moments host, Ian Taylor. Sometimes it seems as if God made some creatures just to show us he could do the impossible. Many of these creatures, by their strange nature, offer direct challenges to evolutionary theory. One such creature is a bacterium that has been labeled the toughest bug on Earth. Its Latin name means strange berry that withstands radiation. It can withstand thousands of times the level of radiation that would kill a human. The bacterium was first isolated in the 1950s, but a scientist who began studying the bug in 1988 said, quote, I had difficulty believing anything like this could exist. Many bacteria form hard capsules around themselves in response to radiation. While this provides some protection, the strange berry doesn't form a capsule and survives better than any other bug. While 500 to 1,000 rads of radiation would kill a human being, the strange berry can withstand 1.5 million rads. The radiation shatters the berry's DNA into hundreds of fragments, a hundred times the fragmentation that is fatal to all other bacteria. But a couple of hours later, the DNA is stitched back together, free of all mutations. Evolutionists are puzzled because there is no environment containing this much radiation, so why would evolution develop such a creature? So the strange berry not only challenges evolution directly, but declares the skill and wisdom of its creator. For a printed transcript of today's program, visit our website. All right, we'll leave uh, that uh, notion there, but Dinococcus radiodurans, need to look it up. Uh, really interesting information. Lots of debates on this guy. How would it, could uh, evolution do that? There are some theories, uh, fun to look at, and I'm gonna, not going to go into that now. About so, but amazing how, when if the DNA is all broken up, there's something that has to survive that radiation because it says it's stitched back together. How? Why? Ooh, there must be some proteins and some enzymes and things that survive. That's crazy. All right. So uh, if you get a chance, look at that. Radiocarbon dating, one of the, I don't know, controversial, interesting topics. Uh, so I thought I would give a little foundation on how this works. So in the 1950s, WF Libby, Libby and his students and others at the University of Chicago devised a method of estimating how old organic material, when we say organic, we mean things that are comprised of uh, carbon, hydrocarbons, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. It gotta be made out of carbon. That's what we mean by organic. And we, they can uh, tell how old something is by the level of carbon-14, the isotope of carbon. Let's recall that carbon is made out of three isotopes that you can find. Carbon-12 makes 99% of the carbon that we find. Carbon-13, uh, 1%. And this is an important number to remember that we will, this actually gets used for detection purposes 
purposes in organic chemistry, and then carbon-14, one part per trillion. So there's just this, we'll call it naturally occurring amount of carbon-14 that's with any carbon. You go find it in a tree, in a person. Anything that's made out of carbon is gonna have one part per trillion carbon-14. Now, if you have the right kind of detector, you can find it. So there's a ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 that uh, becomes a benchmark for something that's alive. Well, where does this come from? Carbon-14 uh, is created by the sun. The sun creates, and, and there's enough radiation from the sun as it comes and hits our atmosphere that it's full of nitrogen. This nitrogen uh, gets converted into carbon-14. And you can see it's a neutron capture process um, that creates carbon-14. And uh, I think it's important to understand what happens. So this is, uh, just so you know, one picogram, that's small, per gram of carbon-12. But we have uh, special mass uh, spectrometer devices that can measure these amounts. Once carbon-14 is made, it becomes part of carbon dioxide. Here's the neutron capture process. And uh, creates carbon, a little bit of hydrogen. And this is, it becomes incorporated into CO2. Well, what happens to CO2? It gets taken in, breathed, eaten, consumed, uh, reacted, and becomes part of plants. And anything that then eats those plants also incorporates that. So through a matter of you know, days, weeks, and, and years, this carbon-14 CO2 becomes part of sugar and those who eat plants. Then, as the plant dies, it's no longer um, maintaining the same level of carbon-14, uh, carbon dioxide, and it then will convert back into uh, other forms. So you can measure how much carbon-14 is in an um, item that has organic molecules in it, carbon-based molecules, and they will um, be able to measure that. The half-life is 5,730 years. And you can just detect how much carbon-14 it is and compare it to the ratio that living items have. And you can tell how old something is. Works pretty well for things that are between 100 and 42,000, maybe 50,000 years. We're limited by the sensitivity of our instruments to be able to detect these tiny, tiny amounts of carbon-14. And there's some pretty big assumptions is that the carbon-14 levels, the ratio that's there between carbon-14 and carbon-12, that, uh, that the level it has in a plant hasn't changed, uh, or there hasn't been different levels of carbon-14 uh, throughout history. And so that's actually a pretty big challenge and uh, people know this, so there's been some calibration with using dendrochronology, dendron is for trees, so using tree ring data to go back a few thousand years, actually can go back and you can calibrate the carbon-14 levels compared to what we have now. And so it's been higher and lower uh, throughout history. And that's what this graph is trying to show. So there is some calibration. So it isn't just straight up, let's use carbon-14, let's calibrate it and benchmark it with other methods. So that, that can correct for some, um, uh, materials and some ages and things that may seem kind of strange. So remember, you can't use this technique for millions of years or billions of years. This is only good for uh, tens of thousands at the most. And there's been a pretty big uh, dramatic change in the level of C14 here in the recent history because of the uh, nuclear detonations that took place uh, as the nuclear weapons were being tested. So uh, this graph is showing that in the early to mid 1960s, there was a significant uh, increase in level of C14. So this is going to uh, make it hard to have, uh, you know, be able to accurately date things using carbon-14 for, uh, you know, things in recent history. Uh, so we got to keep that in mind that uh, when we, when things that are, so using this technique is really good for tissues and ma organic material uh, bones and things after they've been sitting around for a while don't don't really have organic tissue around and so you have to uh, use some other methods to radiometrically date um, the other materials that it's in so this is an example of 
uh, Lucy was the name given to some really old fossils discovered in Ethiopia, and they were found to be uh, 4.4 million years old. Well, where did they get that? Well, it's not from carbon-14. That's from using other uh, dating techniques, uh, uh, car or argon or uh, lead, uranium isotope levels, but you measure those in the rock. So it, it really is telling you something about the rock, and then it's assumed that this material, this item, this person, this animal was buried uh, with the rock. So it's really kind of strange that uh, you would ever find any tissue in anything that's old, especially if it's millions of years old. Why? Why can't tissue survive? Well, here is some pictures of uh, what happens to living organisms uh, when they die on our planet. And you can see uh, from the course of June 3rd to July 21, found some pictures in Wikipedia, uh, what happens over, what is this, um, two months, maybe a month and a half, so five, six weeks. Uh, boom, all, most of the, I'm not going to say all of it, but a lot of the organic material is just gone after a few weeks. If something falls down and dies, it is consumed, it is decomposed somewhere between the biology of bacteria, fungus, worms, bugs, ants, uh, other creatures that come by and eat on it, and the chemistry that happens between oxygen, acid levels, carbon dioxide, the radioactivity in your planet, and then you take time and heat, ultraviolet light, and entropy, and things just fall apart. Tissue cannot survive. So for studying dinosaurs, no one has ever thought to even think there would be tissue that could survive that has anything to do with dinosaurs. They have already been uh, designated as living 50, 60, 100 million years ago. And so it's, uh, you know, a lot of surprising things are coming along with dinosaurs. So I'm just going to say a few things. One of them is um, that the fact that you find all these dinosaurs buried in the same place and we, we, find, we find them. And so there was this uh, Newsweek article on the mystery of the Cleveland dinosaur graveyard. Well, this Cleveland uh, is not in Cleveland, Ohio. This is actually out in Utah, I believe. And they found all of these uh, T-Rexes, these, these uh, predators, all buried in the same area. Well, that's kind of strange. I mean, do they, is there some sort of burial process? And so when you go, they die. And so many uh, theories were hypothesized on how possibly these predators are all buried in the, in the same place. And after much scientific inquiry and analysis, this was the interpretation. The interpretation of how the bones arrived at the quarry is in contrast to my prior work suggesting uh, droughts congregated the dinosaurs to the new site. Chemical data supports both the drought hypothesis and the newly proposed flood hypothesis, leaving us with more information on the nature and environment, but still on a scientific quest to discover what happened to these dinosaurs so long ago. So this is uh, public findings uh, using scientific method. How are these all buried? Maybe some drought and then flood, that they had to be buried in a flood. And this is what is seen over and over again, actually, in a number of quarries where they find dinosaur bones that they get buried all at the same time. Very interesting. Well, what people have been digging up dinosaur bones, lots of them out in Wyoming, Utah, Montana. You can go on digs. You can like hire a tour and go do this. I, I've, I've actually done this. To hire a tour, there's an Adventist group out of Southwestern University who, uh, who has a, uh, a, group, uh, a project in, called the Dinosaur Dig. Out of, uh, it's in Utah, and you can go in June. And so my family and I went for like three hours. <laughs> it's in a way out of way place. But anyway. No one ever thought like when you're digging these bones up and there's controversy of how they got there, but it's looking like there's lots of evidence of quick burial. All right, but still, if these bones have been quickly buried, 50, 20 million years, 100 million years, who knows? Um, that, but through the radiation, the time, it, okay, could any of this tissue survive? Well, no one ever thought to look inside of a bone until Mary Schweitzer, um, was pulling at this large uh, bone out of the um, out of the some rock. And it was too big, and she said, "We're just going to have to cut it to move it." And when they when she when they cut through and they started looking and analyzing, they said, "Wait a second! It looks like there's some tissue that is still preserved after all these years." And 
people didn't believe her and she didn't necessarily subscribe to a creationist view. She doesn't. And she's traditional evolutionary perspective and you know, life has been here for a long time. And so she's shown that uh, there's some tissue. They were able to extract it and, you know, and move it around and, and flex it. And, and this should not be the case if they're, they're that old. She also has done some work to show that maybe iron, some excessive amounts of iron that's in the blood was able to preserve it. Maybe. So there's a lot of questions out there. There's, since then, other uh, uh, scientists have found uh, tissue. She's not the only one. Uh, this gentleman, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mark Armitage, uh, Armitage um, had, had found some tissue in uh, T-Rex, I think the bone, not T-Rex, uh, Triceratops. And he, it, it just blew him away. When he found that there was tissue in there, he extracted himself. You can watch some of his videos. And uh, he, that convinced him right there that there is evidence that these dinosaurs actually did not live that long ago. How could this tissue survive this long? So there's some YouTube videos of him kind of responding to uh, people's claims and, and, um, and there's a lot of controversy in, in involved with this, but it's kind of where, where we're at. Dinosaurs are, are interestingly enough becoming sort of the poster children for maybe that life is not that old here on this planet. So I encourage Hi, you. Hi, this is Mark Armadou. We're not going to watch this video. It's great. It's kind of interesting. Um, another uh, situation has ar arisen because, wait a second, if we're finding tissue, oh, that's organic material. We could go carbon date it. So there's some research groups who have, and then they wanted to present their uh, report and at a national conference, just reporting what they found. And so they actually found that the ages appear to be somewhere between uh, 22,000 and 39,000 years ago, not million years ago, thousands of years ago, because they did find some carbon, uh, carbon 13 and 14 here to be able to document uh, their ages. So uh, they were able to present their data. But interestingly enough, there's a, uh, there's a story that goes with this that uh, one of my colleagues on the Faith and Science Council uh, presents here uh, on a creation Sabbath about, his name's Paul, Dr. Paul Geem. He um, documents and talks about this, the situation that happened uh, not too long ago where a group wanted to present about these dinosaur tissues having a short age. Well, they were able to present, but when they uh, were wanting to go back and reference and show, hey, look, here, here is where, where um, our abstract and how we presented, their information was removed from any post-meeting uh, materials. Um, the organizers, organizers of the talk uh, found out what they were uh, presenting, and they were basically said, uh, we're cutting out anything in our post uh, materials that go along with this uh, conference. So, uh, so this uh, my, my colleague, Dr. Paul Geem, uh, goes in and describes this whole process, and you can watch his 20-minute uh, or so video on the Adventist Learning Community. Uh, community. Uh, there's some great videos from other organization is Genesis History. That's actually the name. Uh, if we had time, we would watch it, but I hope you would go watch it. Okay, so I'm going to watch it here. There's some other things that go with the along with the uncertainty. And so, okay, I mean, hey, if you trust carbon-14, why are we getting these, these, uh, these short ages for dinosaurs? We should be getting, shouldn't be even finding any carbon-14. It should have disintegrated away. Now labs won't even take anything dealing with... Uh, carbon-14 dating, radiocarbon dating of dinosaur bones, labs won't even touch it. They don't want, they don't want to, there's, there's analytical labs that deal with this, and they don't want to even get involved with that. So there's that, and then there's some other uh, interesting things that perhaps even plants deal differently with carbon-14 and carbon-12 um, as they um, process carbon dioxide and other carbon molecules that perhaps um, the proportions aren't what we think they are. And so things are uh, a little bit older, they would test older than they actually are. So uh, there's, there's a lot of ongoing issues with this. It's not a cut and dry uh, situation with radiocarbon dating. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has done quite a bit um, already 
uh, with the group out of uh, Loma Linda University and the Geoscience Research Institute. And they uh, have been funded by the Faith and Science Council, a group uh, that's organized and run by the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And I, I am a member in full disclosure of this. And they have been uh, doing a lot of work under the leadership of Dr. Ben Clausen. And they have been exploring and dating using uh, dating of rocks, looking at, at just trying to get a comprehensive picture of what's going on. And they have been publishing papers and uh, they are finding some really interesting theories and thoughts on this whole process as it relates to the biblical accounts. And a lot of it deals with the flood and how it mixes things. And uh, I'm always excited to see his, his recent reports. He's, they're getting a lot of people involved going up and down South America, North America, and doing a lot of testing. Very interesting. If, you're, if you have more questions in, in this topic, you can go, I think Answers in Genesis has a lot of interesting uh, thoughts there. Uh, Understanding Creation is another book that you can look at. Understand Science and Scripture, Ariel Roth, the Seventh-day Adventist has written some things. These are not Adventist websites. They are um, some other things. If you just want to know about radiocarbon dating in general, you can go to Beta Analytic, a company who, who can provide the service, except if you're testing dinosaur bones. So all of this is to say, we have to do this in context to understanding that the earth itself is the most radioactive place. Why does it have all this radiation? Is it there for uh, dating so that we can understand how old the planet is? Maybe it's to trick us. Uh, the, the, the earth has this incredible amount of heat inside. Why does it have there? Why is that heat there? That heat is needed for uh, some very important uh, protective processes in our planet. Where does that heat come from? Let's believe that maybe even up to 90% of the heat is from radioactive isotopes, potassium-40, uranium-238, uranium-235, thorium-232. These create heat. And a lot of this radioactivity is, uh, is in the crust, it's, uh, it's in the mantle, it's there. Small amounts distributed all over, why? To make our planet um, radioactive, to make it heated for that lasts a long time, billions of years. So maybe some estimates were down to a half, some up to 90% that this radioactivity accounts for a quite a large amount of heat. Why does it need all this heat? That heat is very important. It helps keep the planet warm and keeps this dynamo effect happening inside the planet to generate a magnetic field. That magnetic field is very important. It also, uh, uh, as you, it kind of keeps the rock and stuff warm so that it, this plate tectonic and the recycling of the crustal elements can take place. The magnetic field is critical for protecting our planet from the extreme solar radiation that's coming from our planet. There's this uh, from the from the sun to hitting our planet. So it's a protective barrier. Without this magnetic field, strip away our atmosphere and damage and, and hurt life on this planet. When you even get started, this magnetic field needs to be there. So how did it become radioactive? A lot of people want to just say, ah, oh, God made it that way. But you know, I would tell you that uh, we need to think about this, and it looks like it's a long-term heating solution as a design parameter. Design comes from an intelligent mind because if there was too much radioactivity, it would kill life. Uh, and if there's too much radioactivity, too much heat, the plate tectonics would not work as well. And too little, uh, of course, we would not have enough heat. So there's too little, too much, we start to see intelligence taking place there. And uh, if you try to heat it another different way, you would start adding a lot of mass that would change gravity. And gravity changes what gases you hold on to, what's in the atmosphere, what, can, what stays and what goes. We start holding on to ox uh, hydrogen. Hydrogen and oxygen react, very reactive together. So uh, design, 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 all the way through this. So this is a very interesting topic that I hope a number of you would get into and start learning more about. Well, that's our time for today. Hopefully you learned a few more things about uh, radiometric dating, how that fits into the heating of our planet. A lot more to discuss, but uh, we'll keep it there for now. All right, thanks for joining me. We'll talk to you later.